Hello, and welcome to our program, the Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Campus. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture of PATH Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association. Membership in which is open to uh, trainees in pathology and uh, uh, pathologists from uh, developing countries uh, uh, at a complimentary no charge uh, rate. Uh, we want you to be able to use the educational resources uh, that are here uh, for your benefit. And an example of that are some of the things we'll be talking about today. I've chosen the topic of uh, tumors with myxoid features to help illustrate a, a common conundrum that uh, arises uh, when we receive a biopsy that shows uh, a lot of uh, myxoid tissue. And uh, the list of tumors is oh, not uh, lengthy, but uh, certainly not short either. So uh, let's uh, launch in and see where we go. First of all, what is uh, this myxoid change that we're talking about? Well, uh, myxoid tissue uh, has been evaluated with uh, various uh, methods and extractions and uh, histochemistries and so forth, and primarily composed of collagens and proteoglycans. Uh, the proteoglycans, however, can be quite variable uh, and includes this uh, long list of uh, substances that I don't usually deal with uh, on a first name basis. Um, of note, however, is that there is some uh, variability in terms of uh, which uh, proteoglycans are present in which uh, particular tumors. And uh, to some degree, that uh, has been helpful in classification, or at least in understanding the factors that are going on. We might also think about this in terms of uh, which uh, of these are physiological, uh, because myxoid tissue really derived from the observation that it was somewhat similar to uh, Horton's jelly that was uh, present in the umbilical cord uh, versus those that are pathological. And some may be associated with uh, both non-neoplastic as well as uh, neoplastic uh, uh, disorders. Uh, so uh, there are distinctions certainly between with mesenchymal and the epithelial uh, myxoid changes that can be present, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, proteoglycans uh, that are present with the epithelial uh, uh, tumors tend to have more uh, things like uh, versican, lumican, et cetera, uh, than the uh, mesenchymal neoplasms. Uh, but I'm not gonna go into that classification. Just so you're aware that it exists, uh, that may be sufficient. So let's talk about the good guys. Who, who, are, the, who are the friendly ones in this uh, uh, group of tumors? Well, this is the, the short list of uh, what you might think of in terms of uh, benign myxoid tumors. Uh, although even here, uh, you know, there are tumors here that have uh, malignant variants, such as ossifying fibromyxoid tumor and myoepithelioma. And we often think of, you know, deep angiomyxoma as having somewhat aggressive or uh, worrisome uh, 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 behavior. Uh, so uh, the malignant variants uh, can occasionally uh, cause uh, some concern and uh, dif difficulty in differentiation. So let's start with intramuscular myxoma, certainly the, uh, the most common of these lesions. And I still remember the very first one of these that I diagnosed uh, as a young, uh, uh, actually still a pathology resident uh, doing a locum's tenens in uh, uh, rural, Vermont, uh, rural New England. Uh, and uh, feeling like I had, you know, hit a home run uh, over the green monster. Uh, these uh, tumors uh, have a very characteristic morphology, uh, which is kind of a non-morphology. They're very myxoid, uh, hardly any cells, uh, and just a very few trace uh, blood vessels that can be seen. Uh, very uniform spindle or stellate-shaped cells, uh, no atypia at all to be concerned about. Uh, and if we're fortunate, we catch uh, a bit of the skeletal muscle that says, aha, this is something arising in the muscle. And so we give it a descriptive name like intramuscular myxoma. Uh, others may have uh, fewer blood vessels, uh, just a few traces, such as you see here, uh, and a variably uh, stained uh, myxoid background, a little bit of loose uh, fibrous tissue at the periphery. Uh, as you can see here. And sometimes they can have a little bit of nodular character to them uh, with areas of increased uh, myxoid change versus uh, a more uh, conventional uh, edema. Uh, here's the example our, uh, our uh, sentinel photograph came from uh, where you can see, again, a few delicate vessels, 
uh, but mostly just this very loose posse cellular tissue. Um, so this is usually sporadic, but there is a syndrome where you get uh, certain uh, bone tumors associated with uh, myxomas. Uh, usually these are adults, more commonly females, lower extremity, most common location, but other locations also seen, uh, bland cytology, inconspicuous vessels, and non-destructive invasion. Uh, it can be sometimes more cellular and collagenous and so forth, and uh, has a slightly different name in that setting. Uh, these are negative with S100. Um, EMA has been reported, but rarely do we need to do that. And if you're really uh, hyper uh, uh, concerned about something, you can do uh, GNAS uh, gene mutation studies to verify. Now, a fairly similar morphologic lesion is the juxtacortical, juxtarticular, excuse me, juxtarticular myxoma. And these QR codes will uh, take you directly to the slide if you'd like to review it while I'm uh, talking about them. Um, here's the uh, nice example that we have. This was in a uh, middle-aged gentleman uh, occurring next to his uh, uh, left knee. Uh, and as you see, there's a nodular architecture to these, uh, not uh, real clear as to their uh, boundaries. Uh, they may have a, a somewhat infiltrative uh, pattern. Here you see a little bit over here. Uh, and again, a very postacellular, bland cytology type of appearance, uh, blue mu uh, mucoid, mixoid changes in the background, and a little bit of vasculature. Now, in contrast to the uh, intramuscular uh, myxomas, these do not have the GNAS uh, mutation, um, and these tend to have a little higher risk of recurrence uh, than the one. So the, the main thing is to think of your location, uh, this is not occurring inside the muscle. This is occurring in the uh, periarticular tissues around a large joint, usually the knee, 85% of cases. Older man versus uh, woman in uh, uh, intramuscular uh, myxoma. And this has a recurrence potential that's not trivial. Uh, it does not metastasize, however. Superficial acral fibromyxoma. Uh, is a tumor that is uh, less myxoid, but still has this uh, fibromyxoid change. And you can see here the pale blue uh, tissue in between on the higher magnification view. Uh, again, a link to the slide that we've used here. Uh, and you can see uh, here this uh, myxoid, very bland tissue. A lot of sort of wavy collagen in here that might be useful uh, to thinking more about the fibromyxoid uh, type of lesion. Uh, these lesions uh, occurring in the uh, um, uh, distal extremities usually, so that's why sometimes they're called the digital fibromyxoma, um, oftentimes in a periungual region on your fingers or toes. Um, and it's usually in the dermis, uh, not encapsulated, and as we've indicated, a variable uh, myxoid and collagenous stroma. Uh, there is loss of RB1 expression, so that can be a useful uh, immunohistochemical marker, indicative of this uh, deletions of 13Q12. Uh, and again, these do have a, a moderate uh, recurrence uh, uh, risk. Well, I should hardly need to, to show a picture of this. The ganglion or digital mucous cyst uh, can also have this very prominent uh, myxoid change. Uh, but many examples, such as this one, uh, have really uh, no uh, myxoid change at all. So you just see a, a very fibrotic uh, type of pattern with just a trace of myxoid uh, tissue here around the cystic space, uh, a little bit of a slight uh, bluish myxoid change here adjacent to the more collagenous tissue. Uh, but some of them can have this quite ex extensive uh, extravasated mucin appearance where you get uh, little areas like this uh, with a little bit of vasculature. And uh, given the location, you might be uh, concerned about a, a juxtaarticular uh, myxoma. Uh, but if you've got it in association with good uh, synovium type uh, cystic spaces like these, uh, you can probably uh, surmise that this is going to be a, a ganglion with uh, soft tissue extravasation of the uh, uh, of the myxoid uh, mucoid, mucinous uh, tissue. Uh, here's another example uh, here, again, with a little bit of involved bone 
Uh, and sometimes these uh, ganglion cysts can be uh, intraosseous, as is this one. Uh, and so then sometimes you can get this myxoid change uh, in the surrounding tissues uh, of that uh, bone lesion, but usually not a diagnostic problem. Now, one that's a little bit more challenging is the ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. Uh, this tumor has uh, uh, quite interesting uh, morphology, which you can see here, and here's a link to the accompanying slides. Um, but uh, not all of these will have uh, the osseous component. So here's one that's very, very mixoid uh, and has uh, this, uh, you know, just scattered single cells, almost in a chondroid type of appearance. Uh, and variable uh, cellularity here, some degree of atypia even in some of these cells, uh, which brings up the, the consideration that some of these lesions do have uh, metastatic potential. Uh, although the majority of ossifying fibromyxoid tumors are entirely benign, uh, nicely encapsulated uh, with this uh, pattern of the ossification occurring uh, primarily in this uh, peripheral uh, encapsulated portion. And as you can see here, it's occurring in the uh, dermis or subcutis uh, with this uh, uh, very bland sort of chaining of uh, cells uh, rather than the stellate uh, spindle-shaped single cells. Uh, there is a degree of connectivity almost between some of these cells uh, in this lesion. Um, mixoid tissue and then this very characteristic uh, nice lamellar bone uh, around the periphery uh, of these lesions. Uh, I've got a couple of examples. Here's another one where you had sort of multiple uh, tongues of this uh, uh, type of tissue, uh, some with bone and some without, uh, as you see here. Uh, and uh, here, a little bit less uh, mixoid, uh, not a lot of uh, mixoid change to this, but a more fascicular type of pattern. So if you just had this type of a, a sample, you would be hard pressed to make the diagnosis of a mixoid neoplasm. Uh, likewise here, occasionally you can get areas that begin to uh, form osteoid-like uh, tissue within the center of the, uh, of the lesion. But again, very sparse uh, myxoid changes to this uh, lesion here, even though we have this uh, nice peripheral ossification. Um, so uh, the amount of myxoid tissue can be quite uh, um, uh, variable, and, and if it's sparse, that it could be uh, misleading in terms of the, making the diagnosis. Uh, one more example, uh, this from uh, subcutaneous location. And in, in this instance, uh, we see the uh, uh, formation of the bone uh, right here in the middle of the lesion, not at the periphery. Um, and it's kind of a woven bone rather than the lamellar bone that we saw in some of those other examples. Uh, this would be a marker to be uh, raise the concern for possible uh, malignant behavior. Um, and uh, there are other markers here that I'll run through in terms of malignancy. Um, one high-grade nuclear, uh, nu high -grade nuclear uh, characteristics, high cellularity, mitotic activity uh, greater than two per 50 high power fields. So those along with uh, that change we saw with the bone uh, might uh, be of uh, concern. Other things to be aware in this uh, lesion, usually extremities, trunk, head and neck, kind of in that order. Um, lobulated mass, incomplete shell of bone, very mon monomorphic ovoid cells, and variable amount of fibromyxoid stroma, as we've illustrated. Um, these are often S100 protein positive and may express Desmond. So kind of an interesting uh, kind of question, Pecoma-like uh, phenotype in some respects there. Um, and they do recur. Uh, uh, metastases are very rare in the benign cases, but can be uh, more significant when you've got uh, these uh, malignant features of uh, higher nuclear grade cellularity and mitotic activity. So superficial angiomyxoma, we're kind of uh, dancing around uh, these tumors. There's a, a, a bit of uh, overlap in some respects here, uh, but I think you can see the reason this got the name it has. It has these variable, small uh, capillary and uh, uh, microvenular size vessels uh, with this surrounding uh, myxoid uh, stroma. Uh, and here's a, a nice example. Uh, it's il illustrative because, as you see, it's uh, fairly subtle. It's not sharply demarcated. It's here in the subcutis. You might almost mistake it for elastotic change. Uh, 
um, and uh, just a very scant amount of uh, vasculature associated with this uh, lesion. Um, uh, like we're just kind of on the top of the lesion. I think we've got another example here uh, as well. Uh, again, ill-defined variable extension up into the subepidermal spaces, uh, vessels of varying size, uh, kind of like we had in the uh, uh, aggressive angiomyxoma that we'll talk about later. Uh, this one's interesting also because we have these uh, areas of uh, superficial vascular ectasia with uh, variable uh, thrombotic uh, changes and organization of the thrombus. And another example showing you, again, this uh, nodularity, irregular distribution in the derva, dermis, um, small vessels, and here a little bit more collagenous uh, tissue associated with this uh, lesion. So usually this is a benign lesion. To, it's not going to have a high recurrence rate. Uh, dermal nerve sheath myxoma is another uh, myxoid tumor. I didn't, couldn't find a good uh, histologic example, so I had to borrow some pictures. Uh, from our text, uh, but a, a multinodular dermal uh, tumor with uh, some uh, evidence of uh, lobularity and myxoid change between cells. Here you see the sort of fibrillar uh, processes of some of these cells, uh, and they're going to stain nicely with uh, S100 protein, indicating the, the nerve sheath uh, nature of the lesion. Now we come on to the myoepithelial lesion. So this is a, kind of an epithelial tumor that can have a very prominent uh, myxoid change. And I've got a couple of examples here. So here's one here uh, beneath the mucosal surface. Um, and uh, I think this is one we took our, our sentinel example from. Uh, you can see here that uh, the cells tend to chain and cord up, uh, very sort of rhabdoid appearing cells, but lots of intervening uh, mixoid, loose uh, glycogen or gly proteoglycan rich stroma, a small nest, a few single cells here and there, uh, but they look different from those uh, stellate uh, mesenchymal lesions uh, that we've been looking at uh, previously. But still a very mixoid background, and uh, given uh, the vagaries of uh, sampling, you could be uh, concerned about other mixoid tumors here as well. Here's another example, a little less well stained. Um, you can see again, a uh, little chaining and connectivity of these uh, lesions, some degree of organization with intervening abundant uh, loose uh, acellular uh, mixoid uh, ground substance. Now, myoepitheliomas can exist in a uh, malignant uh, variety, and here's an example. Uh, this one, again, occurring in the, the skin, uh, you can see this very uh, mixoid, almost chondroid type of appearance, uh, sort of lacunar uh, uh, areas. Uh, but notice the nuclear and cellular pleomorphism here. Uh, these are not chaining together in quite the same way. They seem to have lost some of that uh, desire to connect with their uh, neighbors and so forth. Um, and there's more pleomorphism uh, to this uh, lesion. Uh, so uh, uh, malignant variants of uh, myoepithelioma uh, do exist, uh, myoepithelial carcinoma, and we'll just touch on some of the differential considerations here. So metastatic carcinoma could come into the con concern, as well as melanoma and uh, epithelioid sarcomas. Uh, any of those, except for melanoma, could be keratin positive uh, or express uh, epithelial membrane antigen positivity. Um, Myoepitheliomas usually express S100, as would uh, S1, as would uh, melanoma. Um, they're all typically negative for CD34, whereas uh, epithelioid sarcoma might be positive. Uh, and the uh, key differential there is the uh, uh, loss of INI1, which may be sort of patchy or variable in myoepithelial carcinoma, but should not be present in uh, regular conventional metastatic carcinoma. So uh, myoepithelioma is usually third to fifth decades, uh, limb and limb girdles. Um, head and neck, though, also seen salivary glands. Of course, we can consider them associated with that, and maybe even breast. Um, this reticular growth pattern with this chondral myxoid hyalinized stroma is uh, frequent. Uh, and as we've indicated, there's this nest and cording of cells. Um, 
uh, sort of pitfall here to be aware is that SOX10 can be positive in these lesions, um, and that can could, could potentially confuse you with regard to melanoma. Uh, and these also have an EWSR1 gene uh, rearrangement. We alluded to mentioning the deep aggressive angiomyxoma. Well, let's talk about it right up front here. So this is a lesion that typically uh, involves the uh, uh, inguinal and uh, groin areas, the uh, vulva, perineum, and so forth. Uh, and because of its uh, propensity for recurrence or lack of boundaries can be uh, become uh, aggressive. So the lesion has uh, variable uh, patterns of uh, vessels, uh, varying sizes, as you can see here, some capillaries, some venules, some arterioles. <clears throat> And it typically has a fairly bland appearing uh, spindle cells, a slightly stellate stroma, a bit of myxoid change in the background, and maybe a few other inflammatory cells coming along for the ride. Uh, here's another example to give you a, a feel for, uh, again, the variability in the kind of vessels that are present. They're not all arching uh, uh, capillaries. There's a mixture here of uh, cell types. Uh, and you can see, again, a little bit of collagenous uh, matrix, a lot of intervening myxoid change, but no cytologic atypia, uh, nothing that says, I'm going to cause you problems, um, other than the fact that we can see that it's very uh, poorly margin. There's a very poor definition of its margins, either up towards the skin or uh, towards other tissues. So that's what makes uh, recurrence uh, such a uh, insidious process for these. Uh, and one further example here, uh, again, showing this uh, variable sizes and shapes of the uh, uh, vessels that can be present here, um, bland cytology, uh, mixocollagenous uh, background with some spindle-shaped cells. Um, so uh, nice examples to sort of study and get uh, into your mind to think about when you see uh, biopsy in the appropriate setting. Most commonly, this is women, uh, middle-aged uh, young adults, uh, vulva, vagina, inguinal area, some extension into pelvic soft tissues can be seated. Uh, this can be quite an infiltrative mass um, and uh, some smooth muscle that sort of spins off the blood vessels. I didn't find that to be very helpful. Uh, you come back to a location like this, and I just don't see that... Uh, uh, radial spinning off of uh, smooth muscle, uh, particularly from any of these vessels uh, in this lesion. So uh, I don't uh, I don't find that. Now it's been said that H HMGA2 protein expression is specific for this uh, diagnosis, and I think in most instances that is true. We have seen, however, some cellular fibromas, however, which we believe have expressed HMGA2, which also is in the differential. Um, this, as we've indicated, occurs recurs uh, with some frequency, but does, gener does not metastasize. All right, well, let's move on to the uh, more uh, worrisome malignant tumors and talk a little bit about them as well. So here's our list. We've talked about myoepithelial carcinoma and ossifying fibromyxoid tumor that can both behave in a malignant fashion. But we're going to focus the latter portions here of our talk on myxofibrosarcoma, Mixoid liposarcoma, extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma, low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, and mixo inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma. So that's a lot of mixo fibro sort of stuff in there. Um, keeping all of these straight uh, is uh, a challenge, and we'll try to make that uh, clear uh, from our discussion. Now, we haven't mentioned mixoid variants of leiomyosarcoma or mixoid variants of uh, other. Uh, sarcomatous uh, tumors. Uh, most of those, especially the mixoid uh, MFH and so forth, have been moved into uh, mixoinflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma or mixofibrosarcoma. So we don't really have that category anymore to worry about. Uh, so let's see where we go. So mixofibrosarcoma, uh, this is generally a high-grade sarcoma with a somewhat lobulated appearance, as you can see from here. Um, and uh, but uh, there are uh, occasionally lower grade versions of this mixo uh, inflammatory, excuse me, mixofibrosarcoma that can occur. 
Uh, here's a very cellular one, but not a lot of nuclear pleomorphism. Uh, and so uh, sometimes in this situation, the uh, differential with uh, low-grade fibromyxosarcoma comes into play. Uh, and in terms of that definition, age group, location, uh, and potentially uh, staining with uh, BUC4 uh, could become uh, very useful uh, differentiators in terms of the correct uh, classification. Uh, more typically, uh, myxofibrosarcoma is going to be uh, a high-grade tumor, as this one is. And you can see it's very blue, but the blue is this myxoid background. Uh, and we have some considerable pleomorphism along with the uh, other uh, stellate cells, spindle-shaped cells in this uh, tumor. Uh, notice also we have here uh, areas of uh, both myxoid and non-myxoid uh, tissue uh, with the intervening uh, tissue showing a high cellularity, variable pleomorphism, but certainly enough to put it in that high-grade uh, uh, neoplasm camp. And then we get some uh, multinucleate pleomorphic uh, and bizarre uh, cells uh, along with this. Uh, so where does this, uh, what, where does this uh, tumor usually fall? Well, this is usually old patients. Low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma is younger patients, so young, old. Uh, that's, a, that's a sharp distinction, I know. Um, but also lower limbs and upper extremities and subcutaneous, uh, sort of more superficial, whereas uh, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, deeper tissues. Um, as we've indicated, hypocellular myxoid areas with hypercellular fibrous areas, we just saw that. Uh, vessels, variable degree of pleomorphism, um, and occasionally epithelioid morphology can be uh, seen. Uh, so cellularity is the most important in criterion for grading, uh, and this has a very high local recurrence rate, uh, but uh, variable uh, mitotic, or excuse me, metastatic uh, rate. So myxoid liposarcoma, uh, this is a uh, tumor with uh, different histogenesis, but uh, similar uh, histology in terms of the myxoid stroma uh, and has variable uh, uh, degrees of uh, pleomorphism. So here's a needle biopsy, and this is a useful uh, tumor to be able to nail down on, lip on needle biopsy. Here you can see almost these uh, uh, interspersed uh, bands of almost vascular-like tissue, certainly around a vessel. Uh, so not clear what of that is uh, tumor cells versus uh, neovasculature. Uh, and then over here, we have this very myxoid tissue, uh, again, with uh, prominent vasculature. Uh, and as you begin to see here, uh, maybe a suggestion of a characteristic uh, lipoblast. So here, are two of the very hallmark type of lipoblasts in this uh, tumor, which are kind of the bi uh, double uh, droplet uh, lipoblast, uh, where the lipid indents the cell uh, mem nuclear membrane and gives you that appearance. So we can identify frequent lipoblasts in this tumor. Uh, and if we find that uh, sort of double droplet uh, pattern, uh, that's particularly helpful. Uh, in this tumor. Uh, but other morphologies as well, just more myxoid areas and less lipogenic uh, appearance. There's our round cell tumors uh, that also have this similar uh, cytogenetic uh, abnormalities, but uh, not as many lipoblasts uh, as we've seen here. Here's another example. I think actually this is the excision of that uh, needle core biopsy. Uh, showing the vasculature, the very myxoid appearance, uh, and areas obviously with uh, nice uh, lipoblast, uh, variable lipid droplet sizes, and so forth, corresponding to these uh, uh, fat precursor cells that are present in the tumor. Uh, and a third example, not as well stained, but uh, again, showing you some of the kinds of uh, myxoid changes that you can see here. So myxoid liposarcoma is uh, generally younger patients. Uh, it is the, the most common type of liposarcoma in children and adolescents. Uh, it's usually lower extremity, deep-seated type of tumor, um, and uh, 
this uh, mixoid background with monotonous cells, thin walled branching capillaries, and these uh, bivacuated lipoblasts, as I've mentioned. Uh, there are uh, high grade versions with the sort of round cell sar sarcoma, high cellularity, sheets of round cells that can be seen. This is the same tumor in terms of behavior and molecular genetics. The, both tumors have this translocation, uh, either 1216 or 1222. Uh, that involves the Q of uh, 13. Um, these have a high metastatic rate, uh, over 40%, and mortality uh, not uh, trivial as well. I tend to go to other soft tissues, the spine, bone, and lungs. Uh, and so these are, are things to be uh, considered with this uh, tumor. Extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma. It's actually not a true chondrosarcoma per se, but has this very uh, mixoid appearance uh, and uh, sort of looks like a chondroid pattern. So it's got uh, single cells with maybe a lacunar type of uh, uh, background. And the, the mixoid change is very chondroid. Uh, it's very uh, basophilic, uh, as you can see both at low power and here at higher magnification. Uh, it's got a little sense of a sort of lacunar type of formation. So it looks uh, chondroid in that sense. Um, and certainly we have mixoid changes in chondrosarcoma that can look very much like this as well. Uh, but it doesn't form the classical lacunae of uh, chondroid tumors, um, at least in the, in the better differentiated areas. Now this tumor also is associated with a, a rearrangement of the NR4A3 gene, usually with EWSR. Uh, so since this is a fairly common uh, probe that's available in many fish labs, you may be able to identify this uh, fusion gene with the rearrangement for that. Um, but uh, if not, uh, then you search, hopefully you can get access to uh, reference uh, laboratory help. Uh, adult patients, limb, limb girdle is the most common site. Occasionally the head and neck, uh, subfascial, deep to the subfascia, and uh, usually well circumscribed. Um, in terms of other things to be aware of, uh, older age, proximal location, tumor size, uh, these are all features that tend to poor, poor prognosis along with high uh, nuclear or uh, cytologic grade. Okay, coming to low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Uh, this is a low-grade tumor um, and has this uh, nodular uh, pattern uh, that we've uh, seen. Uh, and uh, abundant uh, vessels uh, with this sort of arching, arcading, uh, cascading pattern, like a kind of a waterfall uh, pattern, if you will, uh, and intervening uh, mixoid tissue with very minimal uh, cytologic atypia. As you can see here, these cells are quite well differentiated. Um, another example here, a little bit less uh, lobulated, but again, you can see these sort of arcading, uh, cascading vessels uh, within the tumor and uh, low-grade cytology. Another example, uh, a little bit of lobularity evident here with more mixoid intervening tissue. Uh, and as we come into higher magnification, you can see how some of the vessels uh, tend to stand out here a little bit, uh, the, although the uh, arcading is not quite as uh, evident here as it was in some of those other sections. And a needle biopsy, just to illustrate uh, variable cellularity. Uh, again, in a needle biopsy, you're gonna have a greater difficulty to identify the arcading vessels uh, sort of change. And you might just be left with calling this a, uh, a low-grade uh, uh, spindle cell tumor with the mixoid changes and so forth, and include uh, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma in your differential. Um, that said, uh, if you do the MUC4, that can be very useful. Uh, we do not see uh, nuclear pleomorphisms, um, and then these arcades of blood vessels. Uh, there is a fuss rearrangement in most of the cases, a 716 translocation. Uh, and so if you're able to do fish, fish for fuss, uh, that can help you. 
Um, these do, however, have a uh, local recurrence and metastatic potential uh, that may be uh, long after their initial uh, presentation. So long-term follow-up is required. Well, coming to another high-grade tumor, mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic sar sarcoma. This was at one point called mixoid MFH. Uh, and you can see it's a very uh, mixoid tumor with uh, high-grade areas. Uh, and as we'll see on higher magnification here, uh, there's a fair degree of inflammatory cell uh, infiltrate uh, with this here. You can see some of the uh, inflammatory cells, the neutrophils, polys, and so forth that come into this uh, uh, process. And that's helpful to distinguish it from uh, myxofibrosarcoma, for example. Um, this is uniformly uh, a high-grade appearing tumor, uh, but it almost looks like kind of exaggerated granulation tissue gone bad sort of thing, because you've got all of these uh, vessels and this very mixoid change with a lot of inflammation, uh, much as you would with uh, granulation tissue. Uh, it can be nodular, usually circumscribed in this manner. Uh, that's a helpful feature. Uh, and other things uh, to consider, uh, that this is most common in the subcutaneous tissues and distally on the extremities. Um, it can have these Reed-Sternberg-like cells with this very prominent inflammatory infiltrate and unlike uh, many pleomorphic uh, tumors, this actually does have a T110 translocation. Um, so that can be helpful. Uh, so in that ev even though it looks very uh, aggressive, very uh, uh, pleomorphic and, uh, you know, make you uh, uh, stay awake at night thinking about it uh, because of these Reed-Sternberg-like cells, the uh, binucleate cells with prominent macronucleoli and great degree of uh, pleomorphism, uh, it can actually behave uh, fairly, uh, I wouldn't say innocuously, but at least uh, in a less aggressive fashion than some other tumors that we've looked at. Well, uh, we haven't mentioned a number of other myxoid tumors, uh, both benign and malignant. Here's a couple of those that we could have talked about. Cardiac myxoma, chondromyxoid fibroma, has that myxoid lesion in there, very distinctive location. The nerve sheath myxoid tumors we just barely touched on. And then there are myxoid variants of solitary fibrous tumor, dermatofibrous sarcoma, pertuberans, leiomyosarcoma, synovial sarcoma, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so let's just uh, run through a couple of these. Here's a, a myxoid uh, uh, cardiac neoplasm, uh, very uh, loose posse cellular uh, tissue. Uh, a little bit of endothelialization or prominent cellular proliferation, almost mesothelial type proliferation on the surface, and areas that look an awful lot like organizing thrombus uh, with lots of uh, hemorrhage associated with that. Here's another example, again, showing you this kind of uh, branching, arborizing pattern, a little bit of tufting and papillarity to it uh, with this very mixoid uh, background, a little bit of stellate cells, but not not highly cellular uh, and uh, certainly characteristic location helps with uh, making that diagnosis. Uh, looks like my chondromyxoid fibroma is not going to load, so let's go on. Um, so just to summarize, uh, myxoid tumors have a, quite an array of findings uh, and there are some important distinctions. Uh, however, if you're on one of those benign side of things, then Maybe those distinctions are less critical, although some of those with recurrence potential, you do want to be sharp at getting those, uh, particularly for the low-grade ones, but also in some of the uh, uh, others, such as we've just talked about translocation gene in uh, inflammatory fibromyxoid uh, sarcoma uh, has this. Recurrences uh, is the big issue. Metastasis, less, uh, less of an issue, uh, but many of them have that recurrent potential. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this run through myxoid tumors. Uh, and I hope it's been helpful to you as you encounter the next one on your uh, uh, docket of uh, cases that will come your direction. Uh, if you have questions or uh, comments, please don't hesitate to reach out either directly by email or on uh, any of the other social media platforms uh, where my presence is uh, evident. And I hope that you'll subscribe so that you'll catch on to future uh, releases from our um, uh, channel. Uh, that may be of use uh, to you and your practice. So until next time, thanks so much for joining.